Now let's take another look at the coin tossing example we started out the section with in light of the center limit theorem. So we scroll back through the pages to this example right here. So we tossed a coin five times, we recorded the number of heads. The sample size for your particular sample was only five, and that created a sample proportion for us, which was p hat, which is x over n, which is two over five. And we did this over and over and over um, with multiple students. And we saw, let's think here, so when we did this, we have 5, 10, 19, 26, 27, 28 students total in this class that I took this data from, these data from. And we can see that when I did that, this distribution was skewed left right here. You can see there's a bit of a tail going out to the left. The peak is kind of at 0.6. So a reasonable question might be, why did that happen to us? Well, in light of the central limit theorem, let's say about our conditions. It was definitely random because people were tossing those coins randomly, and they're independent because coin tosses are always independent of each other. But we're going to run a muck of the large enough sample because there's only 28 students in the class, and 28 times P, P is the assumed proportion, or population proportion, which is 0.5, 50-50, um, chance of heads or tails on that coin, and I don't think that 28 was large enough to overcome that. So let's see if I'm right. Alright, so the sample size for our class was 28. Now keep in mind that's not the same thing as the sample size for you. As an individual, you toss the coin five times, and your, you get your proportion. But as a group, when we collect them all together, we did n separate p hats, if you will, n separate toy toss experiments. So does not necessarily meet the conditions. So condition number one is random, and that is definitely met. Right? So we met that condition of randomness with no problem because coins are random. Right? So the coin tosses were random, and as long as people really were honest about the results, which we have no reason to believe they wouldn't be, then we're fine. Because coins are random. Condition number two is the independence part. Now, you might be thinking, oh, do I have to worry about 0.05 and capital N and all of that stuff? Sorry, let me go back to the central limit theorem. So if you look at condition number two, it talks about the observations are independent of each other. You only have to worry about this whole second phrase right here if it's without replacement. But we're not without replacement, we're with replacement. Because every time you pick up a coin, it has replacement. So we have observations that are independent of each other because they're coins, and coins are always independent. All right, so condition one and two are yes, but condition number three, I think we're going to have problems. So let's see if I'm correct. Condition number three says that we have to have n times p times one minus p greater than or equal to 10. So we need n, our sample size, to be large enough. And this is where I think we're going to run into trouble. Now here's why. n times p times 1 minus p. Oops. There we go. n times p times 1 minus p. Sorry, my computer's being possessed there. n times p times 1 minus p. Well, for us, that was 28 for our sample size, times p, which was 0.5, times 1 minus 0.5. So let me go grab a calculator. There, I pulled that out. So I'm going to take 28 times 0 0.5 times 1 minus 0 0.5. Close my parentheses, enter, and I get 7. So this is equal to 7 for me, but 7 is not bigger than 10. So I wanted this to be greater than or equal to, oops, greater than or equal to 10, and I don't have it. So I want to put a big slash through it. A slash through a sign means you don't have it, where right? it's not greater than or equal to 10. And so therefore n is not large enough. Two 
to ensure the distribution is normal. And we saw that in our graph because it was skewed to the left a bit. All right, so it does not meet the conditions. In particular, it doesn't meet condition number three, and which is not large enough to ensure normal. All right, so then a reasonable question might be, oh, how could this be changed? There's another question right there. So how could we make it better? Well, just have everybody toss twice, right? If we all did more samples, if we all did more, um, if the sample size was larger, then this would be normal. then the distribution would be normal. So a reasonable question might be, well then how large? How large do I need to go to ensure normal? And that's what this question right here is asking. So what would be the minimum number required? So what would be the minimum n, if you will? All right, so let me, this is just gonna be a touch of algebra, just a very little bit. So I know that n goes right here, but I know that p is 0.5. This is a coin we're talking about here. And we know that we want this to be greater than or equal to 10. So I really need to use my calculator and find out what 0.5 times 1 minus 0.5 is. So let me grab the calculator. I'll make a large display for you guys to be able to see. There. So I'm going to take 0.5 times 1 minus 0 0.5, oops, if I get my 0.5 in there, there we go, and I get 0.25. So I know that n is um, multiplied by 0.25. So I want this to be greater than 10. So I want this to be greater than 10. So I want n times 0 0.25 to be greater than 10. And the way you solve this is you divide both sides, because this is currently multiplication. So you divide both sides by 0.25. And of course, whatever you do to the left, you have to do to the right to keep it all fair. So I divide by 0.25. So I'm going to do it over here. Divide by 0 0.25. These are going to cancel over here because 0.25 over 0.25 makes 1. So that's all gone right there. So n is greater than or equal to, oops, greater than or equal to whatever this number is, 10 divided by 0.25. So I'm going to take 10 divided by 0.25 and I get 40. So I would have need to have 40 students in the room performing this task in order to ensure normal, according to the central limit theorem. There we go. There, just added that to ensure normal shape. So to ensure that the shape is normal, we just solved that n must be greater than or equal to 40 if the p, the proportion, is 0.5. All right, now let's consider we have a four-sided die, and you're concerned with p hat, which is the sample proportion of threes. So I have two graphs illustrating below the two sample proportion distributions for p hat. One is with n equals 100, and one is with n equals 1,000. And we're supposed to label each distribution with the appropriate sample size. What is the center and standard error for each of the distributions? And we're just going to assume right there that the central limit theorem requirements are met. And they might say CLT, right? So if they say CLT, that means the central limit theorem. All right, so the key to this is they have the same distribution center and the same shape. They're both normal, right? And they both have that same center at 0.25, which is our mu sub p hat, which is equal to p, which is 1 quarter. But the difference is that when n is equal to 100, we have a spread that is the square root of 0.25 times 1 minus 0.25 over 100. And let me prove that to you. So square root, and then you type 0 0.25 times 
parentheses, 1 minus 0 0.25, close parentheses, divided by 100, and we get 0 0.0433. For the next part, it's going to be the same function, so I'm going to go grab it, but I'm going to go in here with the arrow, so I'm going to move left, my left arrow key, and type another 0 in there, and then move right, so you can see that 1,000 is underneath the square root, the whole thing, all three zeros are under that square root, and I press enter, and I get 0 0.0137. So that tells me that the larger my n is, the smaller the spread is, which shouldn't be any great shock to us because we already learned that in 8.1. And so I've labeled the graphs appropriately. So this black one here, that's the one where n is equal to 1,000 because it has a smaller standard error, smaller spread. And the gray one is the one that has the larger spread, so it has a, lar or a smaller sample size. Right? The larger your sample size, the smaller your spread. The smaller your sample size, the larger your spread. And of course, this idea right here is one of the big ideas for the central limit theorems, both of them, as a whole. Right? As we increase our sample size and we look at this distribution of sample means or sample proportions, we're going to have smaller spread and more normal curves.